Does God hide the truth? Well, yes. But it's right out in the open. Swami often gave the illustration of hundreds and hundreds of years that people thought the world was flat. So if the world were flat and we were on the shore looking at a little boat coming into view, we would see the whole boat as a little speck and the whole boat we would be able to see as it got closer and closer and closer. But the earth is curved. So off in the distance we see the little speck of the mast or the the chimneys, the smokestacks. We see that and then pretty soon more and more of the boat is revealed until finally When it's close enough, then we see the whole thing. But that's because of the curve of the earth. Well, I'm not the first one that ever saw that. It was happening with the Vikings. It was happening with the the Tahitians. It was happening for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But people were convinced the world was flat, and that's just how it was. But just because people think something doesn't mean that it's the truth. So that little illustration is very obvious to us now. But what else is happening in the world that's so obvious and clear, but we haven't grown yet to perceive it? We haven't seen it. I found a <clears throat> very interesting article and uh, was talking about this little man. There's the subcontinent of India, you know, we all know that shape, and then off to the northeast, the farthest northeast, there's a, um, a section of India that's a little it's not contiguous, it's just a little bit separate from the subcontinent. I forget what it's called. Jogat or something? Yeah. There's a bunch of states over there, but Meghalaya, anyway, there's a whole bunch of them. But Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't remember. But the story is about this little island in this province or state or whatever it is, off to the northeast of India. There's a little island, and through deforestation and um, just desiccation by humanity, it's gotten smaller and smaller and smaller because the rains and erosion have just silted it all away. So it's a big island, but it's gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. So, in 1969, this young man loved the island, used to go there all the time, lived on the mainland, and he noticed, uh, I found it very interesting, that he found some dead snakes. Now, I would not have put this together, not being a particular snake lover, But he decided, oh, these poor snakes, they have no trees for shade, and so they're dying. He felt compassion for the snakes, and he decided, I'm going to plant some trees. So every day since 1969, he has planted at least one tree. Do the math on how many decades that is how many trees that is. There's a beautiful little short film if you want to check it out. It's called forestmanfilm.com. His name is Jadoff Payeng. And there's an interview with him. And he's just talking about basically having seen the truth. 
and then deciding to do something about the truth. And naturally, with all these thousands of new trees, the island is silting away. And he has brilliant plans. You know, he's talking all about coconut trees. They really form a barrier. If we just plant those right at the coastline, they dig their roots in and they would protect this island from slowly eroding away. And there's beautiful photography of now there's elephants there, now there's tigers there, now there's all manner of wildlife have come back to this island because it can support life. And he said the the one thing he has to worry about in doing this work is the other people because they all want to cut down the trees and use them for economic gain. And so he was so sweet. He said, I tell them, cut me, don't cut my trees. <laughs> but that man, the little forest man, saw the truth, saw what was happening, and he did something about it. So that's our purpose in life, to grow to the point where we perceive the truth and we can commune with that truth. That beautiful passage from the Bible, you hear the sound of the wind, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit our vibration, it's, there's no shame in it. I mean, a little baby on that island would not have perceived, oh, we're cutting down too many trees and all the animals are going away. The baby has to grow into that expanded consciousness to be able to perceive. So just like us, we have to grow. We have a particular vibration. Science has shown us that everyone has a sound. Our hearts are making a sound. If it's a healthy melody, our hearts are healthy. If it's an erratic melody, if it's a, not a harmonious sound, our hearts are unhealthy. This is a taste of medicine of the future, how we will be able to heal ourselves and others through these subtle truths rather than cutting people open and poking around in there. There's a lot of subtle truth that's available to us. So these great masters, the teachings of yoga, this helps us to lift our consciousness, lift our vibration so that we can perceive more. And so is all the great ones, how did they say it? So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. They have that vibration. And so if we attune ourselves to that vibration, we are lifted up. We can perceive. I had, we had a very interesting experience of living on a different phase, a different level of consciousness. This was back in the mid-90s. We were working for Swami Kriyananda in his publishing house. We were creating books and albums for him. And we were in America, and he was back and forth from America to Europe. He lived in our Italy Ananda Center. And we talked on the phone quite, re quite often on work projects. And one time he called us and he said that he was very, very tired. And he was longing for a vacation, but he, just to get away and rest somewhere for a little while. 
but he didn't know where to go and he didn't have anybody to go with him. Well, we volunteered just spontaneously with no money. <laughs> but we said, Swami, we'll take you anywhere you want to go. And it was a complete leap of faith. It was, we want to help our friend. He's helped us so much. We've got to do this one small thing for him. And we'll figure it out. We'll figure out the money. So he, we said, anywhere, anywhere in the world, Swami. And, <laughs> and uh, so we talked about this place or that place. And, you know, the little dollar signs are... <laughs> Cha-ching, cha-ching, in my mind. Not very much, though, because I just really, I wanted to do this. We both wanted to do this for him. So he was in Assisi, Italy. He wanted to go to Switzerland, so that wasn't a huge trip. And just as an aside, I sort of panicked when I realized that we would be alone with Swami trying to entertain him for two weeks. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say? You know, that's a lot of breakfast, lunch, and dinner trying to make conversation. Huh, I sort of panicked. I mean, I've been working with him for over 20 years, but working is different. You can always talk about work stuff. This was like being charming and doing dinner conversation. <laughs> I kind of panicked on that. So what I did was I went on the internet and I looked for jokes. <laughs> and I printed out like 50 jokes. <laughs> and I numbered them all, I cut them all up, and I had them in my purse. And I would, you know, just... Oh, and by the way, did you hear the one about the... <laughs> And some of them, he would sort of look at me like. <laughs> and other ones, he kind of liked. I remember one that he liked. I'll share one that he sort of liked. Um, the things we do, you know. Uh, so God has created Adam. And they're talking in the garden. And... God says to Adam, well, you know, I'm thinking of creating a partner for you, just so you'd have a friend to play around the garden with. And, um, you know, how's that sound? What would, you, what would you like? And Adam said, well, that sounds really good. Um, I'd like somebody who really takes good care of me and does all the cooking and the cleaning and, you know, really is very kind and loving all the time and sweet and just a, a really wonderful, loving companion. And God says, well, you know, that's going to cost you an arm and a leg. <laughs> and Adam said, well, what do you give me for a rib? <laughs> So that gives you an idea of the jokes that I had. But I was, my intentions were good. So he actually did have a good time on that trip. And we, I remember another little snippet of that. We, he had always wanted to visit the um, Engadine. Engadine Valley. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. And it was a long drive. We were going through that valley and then staying at a little, a small hotel up in the mountains. And so I packed a lunch. And we finally stopped on a little, there was a little bench overlooking this beautiful vista. So I had Swami on one side and Dharmadas on the other. And I hadn't actually had a chance to make up a lunch beforehand. I just had all the ingredients. So I was sitting there between them, making them sandwiches. 
and I just made sandwiches the entire time. They kept eating, <laughs> and I never got to eat anything. <laughs> And I never even got to look at the valley because I was busy doing sandwiches. And so at the end of, they had feasted and said, okay, well, let's get back in the car. And I was like, <laughs> so, it's a silly little thing, but it was very funny at the time. And so we found this nice little hotel to stay in. And Swami had a, a great view and loved everything. But then when he got home, he had, uh, is it called Fodor's travel guide? And he had been looking for a place for seclusion, right? So he saw that on the cover of this travel guide was his exact window where he had been staying. So it was like a famous place to stay and not exactly a place for seclusion. But the point is, when we got home, and I was doing paying the bills at that point, the $5,000 that that trip had cost, I thought, how are we ever going to pay for it? And there was never a blip. There was never even a problem. There was no even notice of that money having gone out. It was just provided in the most amazing way. There was no even stress around it. And I still to this day do not know how that happened. All I know is that God came into my checkbook somehow <laughs> and made it all work and there was no problem. Now I tell you that story for the reason that what we need to do with our lives is put ourselves near these people who have that spirit. The highest that you have in your life, go there and be there with them. That's how we felt about Swami. We wanted to help. We wanted to give. We wanted to be in that vibration. And we thought, oh my God, $5,000, how are we going to do this? God took care of it. Totally took care of it. And we were just up at Ananda. You know, the, the reading also says the Indian phrase, God is not provable. Well, he's not provable through science, through astronomy, through you look all over the universe and where is he? He's not sitting there somewhere for you to, to say, oh, hi, God. He's sitting in here. So we just got back from Spiritual Renewal Week. And if you missed it, you didn't really miss it because it's all online. You can watch all the talks. You can watch all the evening programs. The reason that it exists is to uplift consciousness, to help with attunement with this reality, with this truth that is so obvious if you know it, and so obscure if you don't. But we have to lift ourselves up and attune ourselves to that reality. And then it's laid out before us. We had a, a beautiful kirtan on Tuesday night. It was the first Spiritual Renewal Week kirtan in the new temple. And the acoustics, the architect said, who played kirtan with us was the best it will ever be because it was so open. There were so many exposed rafters. It was heavenly. There was a harp and a cello, violin, and drums and harmoniums and guitars. Ten people we had playing with us, and we were one voice. 
God is not provable, but you can experience him. All you have to do is want it. I want only thee, God. I want to see you everywhere. All we have to do is desire it and attune ourselves to it. And he's right there. He's not in some far corner of space. He's within our own hearts, waiting for you to turn to see him. I promised I would say something about the two songs, uh, Go On Alone, and which was later became Walk Like a Man and Many Hands Make a Miracle. When Swamiji began Ananda in the late 60s and early 70s, he really strongly wanted to encourage people who were willing to take the step towards self-realization to take that step individually. No one could tell them, there, no persuasion, no sort of force of group energy could make them want to go and do this. And so he wrote the song, Walk Like a Man, Even Though You Walk Alone. Why court approval? You've heard us sing this many times probably. Why court approval once the road is known? Let come who will, but if they all turn home, the goal still awaits you. Go on alone. And for many years, that was the theme song he felt of not just Ananda, but of the cooperative communities movement, because it had to be, a community has to be built of people who feel it in their own hearts, not through any other force, but just their own individual commitment. But once the community was established and 20 years had gone by, this other song came to him, Many Hands Make a Miracle, because he felt, okay, we have that kind of commitment. People are seriously wanting to do this in themselves. And then, of course, came the song that you heard this morning, Many Hands Make a Miracle, and it's a lovely energy of sharing. And last evening, Jyotish was uh, greeting everyone, and they are preparing to leave um, this coming Wednesday to be gone for about four months first in Italy and then in India for uh, three of those four months. And so he was greeting everybody and saying, this wonderful week that we shared um, is sort of an example. And that song was sung, Many Hands Make a Miracle. And he said, you know, um, many hands do make a miracle. And a week like this requires many hands to make the miracle of this week. And anyway, it was very sweet. I wanted to touch a little bit on sort of segue on the things that Nirmala was saying about how the truth is around us, but we have to learn to look for it. We have to learn to notice it. Um, friends of ours, I've mentioned this occasionally in different ways, uh, have been challenged by the volcano erupting on the island of Hawaii. And um, Interestingly, Nirmo was talking about nature, and this relates a little bit to nature. Um, there were these little tiny frogs that got introduced on that island kind of as an accident. Um, they came on a, on a shipment of plants from, I think, Jamaica and, or Puerto Rico, I'm not sure which. Um, little tiny frogs, they're the size of a nickel or a dime. Uh, but boy, they can pipe out some noise. It's just amazing. Um, they make this sound that sounds a little bit like a cricket chirping, but I mean, it is m just mega loud. Well, anyway, people thought they were really cute. And so, you know... The, in the beginning. In the beginning. So, you know, you know you'd, you'd go and buy a little plant, you know, a little fern or something that would grow, and it would sometimes come with this little frog. Well, people started asking, hey, can I get one with the, the little frog with it? <laughs> Well, <coughs> these frogs just went wild. They had no natural predators. And I mean, the noise that they can create now, you know, and they, they proliferated to the degree that they were just everywhere. And, it's, and the sound that they make at night is just deafening. I mean, it's, it can be, 
Uh, my friend said, you know, if, if one of them is sitting on a windowsill and just kind of the right acoustic arrangement, one frog in your house can make an ear-splitting noise. I mean, it's just really, really intense. And so when you have millions of these things everywhere, it's just, anyway. So, but Divine Mother decided to remodel the island <laughs> and, you know, 11 square miles of lava, you know, flowed over parts of the island. And in some of those places where the, the lava was flowing like a river, really, really, in fact, like the American River was lava flowing on that island, those little frogs went away. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, my friend was saying, you know, what was fascinating is I moved to a different part of the island where those frogs don't, um, they don't, they're not sort of proliferating there because it's not an, an environment that supports them as well. It's not as moist. He said, you know, I didn't even notice that I wasn't hearing them anymore. <laughs> you know, I had stopped hearing them. And then he said, very interesting, he said, you know, unfortunately, it's the same way with Om. That sound is all around us, but we've stopped listening. We've stopped tuning into it. And we have to learn, we have to remember, we have to tune into it. There's a subtle element to this. And this is one of those exoteric, esoteric kinds of things like Swami was mentioning in the reading. These things are there, in a sense they're in plain sight, and yet it's not plain sight because we have to learn to look inside. We have to perceive what's behind I, I read recently, this was an interesting study, and I even did a little research on it. Um, if you were to plant bamboo as a seed, which is not how it's done typically, but nevertheless, if you could and did, it would take a period of years before you would see a sprout come out of the ground. Depending on the variety, it could be up to five years of sort of patient watering, patient, you know, tending of that grove, of that area, before a sprout would come up. The sprout comes up, and in a span of weeks, that bamboo can grow 90 feet in the air. I say that, I mean, yes, that's amazing, and sort of breathtaking, and kind of like, whoa. And you know that something was obviously going on under the ground <laughs> in order for that to happen when it finally does happen, did happen. In our lives, we meditate or we chant or we do something to, like what Nirmala was saying, describing this story of the young man planting the trees. We do something in regards to the truth. We take some action in our lives. Those, the results of that are not going to necessarily be immediate. In fact, they may be quite long term. But that doesn't mean that something isn't going on. It just may be going on beyond the scope of our present vision. And we have to have enough trust in the process. Now, people who are aware of bamboo and know that world know that if they did that and they went through the process, after some period of years, something would happen and boom, they'd have bamboo growing up. As it happens, bamboo is propagated in other ways, but still, the, the, the image holds. In our lives, we have to be willing to take certain steps and stay with the process for a little while because there is something going on. We will become aware. We do become aware on subtler and subtler levels. Often, it's after the fact that we recognize something. That, that image of the wind blows where it will and we don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And such are those who are born of the Spirit. I think of that in regards to Swami because many times he would do something or he would suggest something and immediately the assumption was, oh, okay, well, I understand why he's doing that. And I, and I didn't understand why he was doing it. I'll just give one example of this. I, I used to take his oratorio program around 
first in California, later in other parts of the country, in the, in the Midwest. And I thought that this was to attract people to Ananda. And I mentioned to him I was a little disappointed because I thought, you know, this really isn't going to, there isn't going to be any traffic beating the door down to get to Ananda as a result of this. And he just said, he looked at me like, well, I never expected that. He had a whole other purpose in mind. He wanted the music to touch people. He wanted the music to help people. He wanted to see and understand. And I could give him this feedback from my own eyes. He wanted to know if it actually touched people, if people were actually moved and uplifted by it. And I could give him absolute evidence. I saw it with my own eyes. If the church was filled, people, were, people would come out with tears running down their cheeks because they had felt something of Christ in that music. So his purpose was on a whole other level from whatever I could understand initially. But I had to be willing to sort of take the first step and say, okay, well, he suggested I do this. I'm going to go ahead and do this and see what happens. In our lives, we have to look for that truth that's behind what we may think it is and be willing to follow the trail, follow the path that is out in front of us, which we may not immediately understand it, but there is something there waiting. And it comes perhaps in layers, but it comes with time and it comes with joy and great meaning, great bliss. I want to share one story from, there was a panel discussion yesterday, and someone asked the question to one of the speakers, Daiva, Nayaswami Daiva, who's the head of the Ananda Portland and Laurel Wood Centers in Oregon. Someone asked the question, how do I know if, how do I know what is my true path? My, what is my spiritual path? And he said, he, he only had a very short time to answer the question, so he sort of smiled and he said, all right, I'm going to make this really brief. He said, look at the people who do that. Look in their eyes. If you see something that attracts you, something that uplifts you, and you feel like they have something that you want, then do what they do. And if you don't, keep shopping. <laughs> and it was a beautiful answer, very succinct. You know, it's like, if, if it feeds you, wonderful. Take it, feast on it, tune into it. And if not, no judgment. There's, you know, churches up and down the street. There's wonderful truth. There's wonderful meaning. There's wonderful depth to be gained. There's all kinds of uh, ways to approach the truth. But there's a way that is, what, what is the best way? Your way. That is the best way. Follow what is your very own because it will lead you unerringly to the truth of God.